Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features The Uncanny X-Men number 289, cover dated June 1992. So the cover here speaks for itself, no captions uh, necessary, but this is the first time that we've seen Storm and Forge romantically engaged since the fall of the mutant storyline back in Uncanny X-Men 226, when they spent a year on the adversaries world together and 227 and uh, this cover by Wills Portacio and inked by Scott Williams and it is a very nice cover indeed um, everyone there with heroic proportions especially Forge who looks like he's about 12 heads tall um, and um, this is our interior art team as well let's open this one up um, oh yeah one other thing to note is that Bishop now has joined the other members of the gold team officially there in the top uh, left hand corner box so let's open this up and we've got a splash page here featuring as it turns out an old photo of the original members of uh, the x-men going all the way back to x-men number one in 1963 and uh, we have a piece of dialogue this is where the dream began so let's open up to our double page spread and what we have here is um, Aurora continuing with her induction of Bishop into the X-Men. And we're in some kind of uh, room with, uh, with um, pictures and photos of important personages in the history of the X-Men. So we've got Professor X there, Magneto there, interestingly, Angel there, Storm herself, the Blackbird. And maybe you can pick out some others as well. And um, Bishop there is uh, basically uh, still cognizant of how much he has to learn after yesterday's unfortunate experience. That was in the previous issue. That was their day trip to Manhattan. I'm fully aware there is much I've yet to learn about this era. So uh, this is a quiet issue, mostly focused on character and characterization. And um, interesting title, Knots. So, there are knots being um, untied uh, that have been um, 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 ongoing for um, many issues going all the way back to Fall of the Mutants between Storm and Forge, but also some stuff go um, from X-Factor regarding uh, Warren Worthington, Archangel, and Iceman Bobby Drake. And the creative team here is Scott Lobdell writing, Wills Portacio pencil, Scott Williams inks, Tom Orzakowski lettering, and Joe Rosas on colors. And one thing to note just about this credits uh, caption is no plotting credit for Wills Portacio. So this is his penultimate, his second to last issue of Uncanny X-Men before he was off the title and en route to Image with the other Image founders. So it is a question here as to whether he's given up on plotting or whether whatever plot he discussed with Lobdell was so thin that really the writing credit um, goes to Lobdell. Um, so an interesting um, consideration. Um, and then what happens is that uh, we get this little character bit here where Storm says when they're off duty, Bishop is encouraged to call her a Roro. And he says, you may call me Bishop, but she storms off. Ho, 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 pun. Not intended, but came out unconsciously. Have it your way, Commander. So Bishop there realizing that He's as ill-suited to interpersonal relationships today as he was in his own time. Uh, but a little bit of a, um, a subtext that maybe there's um, a little romantic um, chem chemistry uh, between the two. It's been suggested um, in the previous issue in particular. Um, and then we switch scenes several floors below to Forge uh, working on some machinery there using his mutant power for inventing things and uh, Bobby Drake turns up Iceman looking for him to help him uh, not as uh, bow tie reference back to the title of the issue as well and uh, Ford says he can't he doesn't know how to uh, not uh, a bow tie and um, and Bobby responds look I may not be your best friend but if there's something you want to talk about you can't uh, because you can't hold back uh, laughing at uh, the fact that Bobby is all thumbs when it comes to, um, or well, at himself actually, he's laughing that he's all thumbs when it comes to formal wear. And here we go with one of these um, tropes 
um, of Wills Portacio's art. So we've got the top down shot um, and uh, no background, <clears throat> excuse me, no background here, but Joe Rosas uh, doing his uh, usual trick of um, coloring in um, a silhouette. So I like the way he's done that. And we're gonna see this um, kind of open panel uh, trope running throughout this issue. And some people um, have uh, thought that maybe it's an indication that Portacio was rushed and skimping on backgrounds, but I think it's a stylistic choice and I like the way it looks. So let's continue. And then we shift scenes to um, somewhere outside on the grounds of uh, Professor X's estate. And we've got a nice little moment between um, Jean and Professor X. Uh, where she's reminiscing about uh, their, uh, the earliest days of the X-Men when she was around 16 and how when they'd get done fighting for their lives against Magneto or Juggernaut or the evil mutant du jour, you'd send us off to bed and she'd sneak out here to this very log. And sometimes she'd spend the whole night trying to figure it out. So lovely art on this page from Portacio inked by um, Scott Williams. Interesting that at this time, it was Art T-Bear that was um, finishing Jim Lee's pencils and inking um, on adjectiveless X-Men. And Williams had shifted over to ink Portacio, but it's a really nice combination. Also wanna make note of the color choices here, here by Rosas, indicating this sunset. Nicely done, just looks so well. Um, the flat colors here in the era before computer coloring. And I like this too. I like the uh, the choice here uh, to leave this panel open for uh, the dialogue, and also again this open panel um, at the end of the page with Jean leaning into uh, Professor X. So really, what's going on here is Jean is uh, has picked up on the fact that Professor X is a little bit out of sorts, and she asks him. Uh, would you like to talk about it? And he says no, and she responds fine for now. And the point she makes here is key. It's not as though your own life has been free of sacrifice. And really, um, there may be some um, reference here to his being um, losing the use of his legs again and or um, being separated from his beloved, Lalandra. Uh, but Professor X isn't talking at this point. And then we switch scenes to somewhere on Long Island, uh, the very ordinary home of William and Maddie Drake. So these are Iceman's parents, but there is an unordinary voyeur watching them from, um, from outside beside a tree. So the two are getting ready to go to dinner with Bobby and his girlfriend, Opal Tanaka. And it turns out that Bobby's father, William, is um, something of a bit of a bigot. Um, as he says here, I just don't understand why a good looking boy like Bobby feels the need to complicate his life by dating an Oriental, like he doesn't have enough problems just being a mutant. Um, the mother though is um, uh, uh, kind of points out to him that his thinking is absolutely archa archaic. And we're gonna learn his age later on <clears throat> in the issue that he's 70. And um, what I was thinking about in relation to that is that if he's 70 in 1992, then he was born in 1922, and that makes him old enough to have served in uh, World War II, and perhaps to have served in the Pacific Theater of Operations. And there, so there might be a little kind of reason, if not excuse, for his um, uh, bigoted attitude towards Opal, who is Japanese after all. And as they're leaving the house, it turns out like we're wondering who this guy is and what, he, what his intentions are towards Bobby's parents, but he's interrupted by someone who turns out to be a cop on the beat. And there's a little kind of topical joke there about um, uh, this character uh, looking like a Teenage Mutant Ninja fan. And um, it turns out to be Hero a character that we haven't seen since X-Factor uh, 63 and 64. And, um, and Bobby's parents though, he punches out the cop because as he says, he's more important affairs to attend to this evening, liter uh, matters quite literally, literally of life and death. But is it that he intends to kill um, Iceman's parents um, or not? Uh, that remains an open question. The parents drive away in any case. And then we're back at Xavier's um, mansion. 
And again, we've got one of these top down um, angled shots by Portachio. And I really like this where, okay, we're not getting the bathroom, but we are getting the mirror and sink and even the plumbing underneath the sink. So a really nice designy arty choice here. Um, looks good to me. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. So uh, they're talking about uh, their respective uh, love lives and, um, and Bobby makes a little bit of a, uh, a boo-boo when he says you used to be quite the clothes horse in your day and this reminds Warren of the changes that have taken place in his life. Uh, in my day, he whispers, just between you and me, dating a blue-skinned angel of death is probably not in Charlotte's best interests. Um, so, Bobby thanks him for nodding his bow tie, um, and Warren tells him, have fun, but then sees himself in the mirror, of course, with the, uh, the blue skin. And, um, and then, shockingly, he sees his old self, we saw a photo of him on the wall back um, in the uh, double page spread on pages two and three. And here he is apparently in the flesh and um, says, it's all in your self image just because your wings were surgically removed back in X Factor 15 and Apocalypse regrew them into these blades of death is no reason to spend the rest of your life sulking. So who are you is Archangel's question. And he reaches out and touches him and recognize is that this person is not an illusion he crashes through the doorway of the bathroom and grabs uh, his doppelganger by the neck and starts ripping uh, into him and then who does it turn out to be except for uh, the shapeshifter mystique so this is a turn up for the books and it turns out that mystique has been staying in the x-mansion as a favor to Wolverine after their adventure in um, Wolverine issues 51 to 53. And she's causing some mischief here. Um, but um, this uh, altercation uh, brings a Storm to investigate and Professor X um, astrally, telepathically uh, tell, <coughs> tells Mystique that she's a guest at the mansion as a courtesy to Wolverine and he expects her to behave appropriately. And she insists that she was only trying to help. And then Professor X asks to see Warren in his study. And this is rather like the old headmaster dynamic going all the way back to the original issues of X-Men. But Warren isn't having anything and he flies out of the window, busting out of the window. The repairs bills <clears throat> for the X Mansion month to month must be um, enormous. So luckily, Professor X is independently wealthy, yes, to cover all these damages all the time. And then here we have a page that must have been rushed because we see here there's a color error. Um, Storm is uh, lacking any coloring on her face. Um, so something went wrong there, but Joe Rosa still providing a little bit of a... Um, a uh, uh, um, a ground level for the top-down shot of Portachio, so kind of suggesting floorboards here, um, but forgetting to colour in Storm's face for some reason. And um, what happens here is that uh, Storm berates um, Mystique, and she res responds, "I was just trying to cheer Warren up, or remind the only one who's noticed he's totally depressed." Then Bishop um, sticks his nose in. Um, taking Storm's uh, place and this is the point that Forge who's watching silently here and here intervenes back off kids he says she gets the point reminder that Forge is um, the oldest one there if not Mystique herself being of the same age as Forge um, they are older characters Mystique doesn't age normally and Forge is what like he's in his um, mid to late 30s or um, if not even 40s, given that he's a Vietnam vet. Um, and he says, Mystique doesn't need to be browbeaten for trying to reach out to Warren, which is more than any of us have done for him in months. So again, this is part of this issue's taking a breather to pick up on some things of, that have happened in the lives of some of the, um, the X-Men gold team characters and just addressing them 
And again here we see some weird coloring going on here with uh, Mystique, um, kind of purple um, um, arms and legs and um, a blue face. So something has uh, gone a little bit wrong there um, with the coloring process. And here she's back to kind of an olive, like a dark olive color. Um, yeah, so something's up there. And um, again, Bishop sticks his nose in. Um, he should have learned the lesson that he thought to himself that he's not suited to interpersonal relationships. And he gets a telling off from Forge. Um, and Forge mentioning, I'm here as a favor to Professor X. Not because I can't bear a life apart from the X-Men. Bishop apologizing again. Mystique looking a little bit delighted. So was she mischief making all along rather than genuinely trying to help uh, for um, Warren? And then Storm speaks up on behalf of Bishop. There is no need to apologize. Forge is merely projecting his own frustrations onto you and this makes him snap. And what do you know about my frustrations, Aurora? What do you know about anything other than yourself? <clears throat> so she goes after him and then Mystique uh, rubs it in to Bishop. Quite the problem solving capabilities you have there, Bishop. You're going to get along wonderfully with your teammates. I can feel it in my shape-shifting bones. Um, and then she jokes along with him again by transforming into his face. So she really is a bit of a trickster mischief maker in this issue but then we pick up with forge and storm and um we get to the heart of it where he says uh she says to him what about her responsibilities to the team and he says what about your responsibility to me the man you love or have you forgotten the year we spent in seclusion trapped on the adversary's world so back in uncanny x-men 226 you said you loved me was it the truth or was it easy to say because we were trapped in the middle of nowhere so you could behave how you liked with no fear of consequences? So she says, how can you question my feelings for you? So this is all really picking up on the fact that even though we've seen them together um, and even though Forge uh, during the non-team era went out in search of Storm, we haven't seen this emotional denouement uh, that we've been expecting regarding uh, what we know about their relationship going all the way back to Uncanny X-Men uh, 186 and Life Debt Part 1. So this really is overdue um, um, emotional accounting between the two. So Storm says the truth is she does not know what is inside her anymore. And he says uh, let me prove it to you. Um, no backgrounds here but interesting designy um work with the paneling here suggesting a kind of like a an immersion an emotional turbulence behind them and let's turn over to the next couple of pages um and yeah this one so here we go this is the climax really of what um, has been building up between them where forge proposes to take her away from this life in, quote, in quotation marks, as an X-Man away. Uh, for years I've seen your courage in saving the world. I've seen your strength prop up the others. Tell me, are you brave enough, strong enough to take a chance on yourself? I realize this is sudden and you um, don't feel you have to answer right away, but will you marry me? So, Forge proposing to Storm. And then the kiss here in this um, open panel. Now, there's a little bit of I was looking at this and thinking about it. I'm not sure about the storytelling here or Orzakowski's positioning of the uh, dialogue because really we want to go um, uh, left to right, down the page, here and here. But what's happening is he's saying this here before the kiss and then after the kiss asking her, uh, will she marry him? Uh, perhaps that's right, but something feels a little off. I think he should be saying everything down here after the kiss. But that's just me. Um, and then we go back to Long Island and we go to the restaurant, the Italian restaurant La Casa Mia, where uh, Bobby and Opal are meeting Bobby's parents. And then um, Mr. Drake is uh, ignoring um, Opal's outstretched hand, recommending the veal instead. So we're going to have a bit of a scene here. Uh, where 
uh, Bobby's mother uh, is welcoming of Opal um, but Bobby says look he stood up to the Sentinels I'm not about to back down to some 70 year old man with a chip on his shoulder what was that all about I think what the two of you is doing are doing is vulgar I thought I thought we brought you up better than that and then in comes Hiro breaking things up and this diner asking for the check that's about right before things go sideways and Hiro says but you're about to die so is there going to be a fight here an attack the last time they fought was back in X Factor 62 and 63 so Iceman icing up here getting ready to go toe to toe with Hiro but a twist he says he's there to rescue Bobby and his family rescue from whom over the page and here they are the Japanese cyber ninjas we haven't seen these guys either since X Factor 62 to 63 and um, what are they there for except to uh, kill Iceman's parents so uh, next we'll have to wait next issue for the conclusion of this this cliffhanger and also we're promised here to get a little bit more about the mysterious Mikhail Rasputin who we haven't seen um, in Uncanny X-Men since uh, issue 286 so presumably still recovering uh, from what happened in that particular issue and his attempt to close a successful attempt to close the portal so the letters pages uh, page here is all about issue 285 so I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 289 the issue in which Forge proposes to Aurora and now this cover makes a lot more sense in relation to what we've seen on the inside beautiful cover great issue let me know what you think in the comments and if you enjoyed this video please like it and if you haven't done so already uh, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this